So you imagine what, something like one trillion dollars, more or less, in, uh, exactly in retirement right. funds. One of the things we talk about, I'm really interested in an update on, is the retirement gap. Where are we stand on this? You monitor this very closely, you study it. Right, so listen, the story is that uh, the Fed has estimated somewhere between four and seven trillion dollars of shortfall in retirement savings. Uh, the issues can be broken down to three parts. Uh, we frankly have uh, a coverage gap. Only about 50% of Americans have access to a retirement plan uh, at work. I've already talked about the savings gap, trillions. And then we have a third gap that we don't talk about, which is the guarantee gap. Uh, we just finished a study, and it turns out that the top thing that people want in their retirement savings account is guaranteed income. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the absence of that in many accounts is creating some instability. So there's clearly work to be done uh, to get more people covered, to get to the right savings, and to give people what they really want, which is guaranteed income uh, in retirement. So the move of the last 20 years or more has been away from guaranteed income. We went right. from defined benefits to defined contributions. Is there anything that can reverse that? Is there anything the government can do or private industry can do to try to fill that gap? Well, the answer is yes and yes. So what can the government do? Um, there's already an act that's passed through the House, I think 417 to 3, sitting, waiting for action in the Senate. It's called the SECURE Act. And that basically would create uh, what's called a safe harbor so that businesses can put guaranteed income into their plan. That's what the government can do. What can the private sector do? They can take up this opportunity by creating uh, an all 401k type plans uh, a guaranteed income option. And that would dramatically increase the security that people feel around their retirement outcomes. How much is the, the already um, disturbing situation exacerbated by lowering lowering yields? I mean, we've just, everybody's rushing to the bond market, buying bonds, and the yields are going down and down and down, and so people don't get as much off their savings. There's no doubt that that makes the, the challenge greater. Uh, the solution to that is to have a broadly diversified portfolio. Um, and so that you're not being whipsawed by what's called interest rate risk or reinvestment risk. So the way we at TIAA run our general account, uh, which backs up the guarantee income that we provide, is by having broadly diversified portfolios. So, yep, you want fixed income. You also want equities. You want alternatives. Uh, and you want to be globally diversified. Uh, and that's one of the ways to try to push back against uh, the slow interest rate environment that we've been experiencing for the last Where have you years. seen the yields go up as the other yields have gone down? I mean, how do you uh, make up for the loss? Well, look, look at where the equity markets are. Uh, so I remind all my colleagues that a low interest rate environment means that other asset classes are likely to be rallying. And we've seen that absolutely in equities broadly defined. Uh, there's been some good pickup in some different emerging market economies. And then the alternative space, you know, real estate, uh, timber, agriculture, uh, infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, there are pockets of good return that are being developed uh, and, and response, if you will, to uh, the low interest rate environment of the fixed income world. Uh, the Federal Reserve has been very much in the news recently. We had this repo phenomenon where the overnight rates are spiking up, which seems to have been taken care of. But is there a larger issue here with respect to liquidity? As we come off of quantitative easing, uh, do we have a larger uh, liquidity issue, if not crisis, looming? Well, I would, I would, I'm glad you uh, nuanced it, because I think there are issues without crises. Um, one of the issues, obviously, is what is the right direction for interest rates? Uh, and we saw in the most recent uh, um, Federal Reserve FOMC decision, three dissents, you know, a couple of folks saying we shouldn't move at all. Somebody said we should move 50 basis points. Uh, and then there is also the question of the size and scale uh, of the Fed's balance sheet. And as they have been gradually reducing that, has that been uh, inadvertently you know, tightening monetary conditions. And so I think you have both of those issues at play here. You know, the interest rates that they target, uh, the so-called Fed funds rate, and then the size of uh, the balance sheet and how that is gradually you know, being adjusted and what that implies about liquidity, but also uh, about the overall state of monetary conditions. Some people suggest, respected people, seem to be suggesting we should be increasing the balance sheet. Uh, we have Stanley Fisher, we have Ray Dalio, talking about the possibility of maybe helicopter money, you can call it what you want, but a situation in which the government would borrow money, as I understand it, to have fiscal stimulus, and the central bank would essentially buy that debt in order to finance it. Does that make sense to you? Look, it's, uh, the individuals involved are, are friends, uh, respected economists, uh, Stan Fisher, Ray, you know, super duper thinkers. 
I think one has to be careful, though, to respect the independence of the Fed. Uh, and so it might be that we need more fiscal stimulus. Uh, perhaps we did earlier. It would be a little unusual at this stage in the game, for sure. Uh, perhaps in Europe, more fiscal stimulus. But then you don't want to get to the place where it looks like the central bank is doing what's called monetizing uh, that. And so I think there should be two separate decisions. Is this the time for fiscal stimulus? I'd argue in the U.S. probably not right now, but maybe in the future if we have a crisis. And then a separate and independent monetary policy that takes the fiscal situation into consideration. We see in the United States and Europe uh, a lack of inflation, I think it's fair right. to say. And before that, we had it in Japan. Is there a danger in that, that we sort of get lulled into a sense of complacency and that we might actually take some actions that it could come back? Well, what we're seeing about inflation is uh, a very interesting dynamic. Um, central banks feeling that they have not achieved their inflation targets, roughly 2 percent, et cetera. And so they are debating, should we continue uh, to lower rates? The citizenry at large, I think, is looking at this world and saying, relatively stable prices, maybe my, my real wages can probably go up some. That may be a good thing. Uh, and so I think what we really are confronting now is uh, that that interface of central bank targets versus the reality and the fact that, and frankly, none of the central banks really know how to engineer you know, greater inflation uh, in this world of global labor markets, uh, global capital markets. It's becoming very, very difficult, it looks like, to get back to some of those targets of 2 percent more or less.